Hello, everybody. This is the Canadian Philosophy Show. Welcome. I, uh, my name is Nicole Kerrigan, and I'm here with my lovely co-hosts. I'm here with Michael Robert Kaditz. I'm here with um, Mark, and I'm here with Tegan. Welcome, everybody. Um, thank you so much for being here. Um, and we're going to talk today about beauty and philosophical conceptions of beauty. We're first going to talk about definitions of beauty and what different philosophers think about what it makes something beautiful. And then we will later talk about why do we even talk about beauty in the first place and does it have uh, an importance in our society? So th thank you everybody for being here and I will turn over the tables to, for you guys to introduce yourselves. So we'll start with Mark, introduce yourself. Okay, so uh, yeah, I'm, my name is Mark Giles. I'm a third year philosophy student and yeah, at Simon Fraser University, yeah. Kagan, introduce yourself. Oh boy, no pressure. Uh, hi everybody, I'm Tegan. I am, as stated before, a weird second slash third year almost hybrid philosophy student at Vancouver Island University. Awesome, thank you Tegan. Now, Michael, introduce yourself. Hi, uh, my name is Michael Robert Kaditz. I am now uh, the technical support guy. Uh, <laughs> I used to be uh, one of the main philosophers on the show, and I'm... Um, I'm getting kind of old and tired of philosophy, and uh, I'm <laughs> although I still love it, really. But I'm handing it over to the to the new generation. They do such a great job. Awesome! Thank you for introducing yourself. That was a great introduction. Um, so let's start talking about um, the concepts and definitions of beauty. So the, this show today is going to be quite open ended. And there's not going to be a specific structure or like, I'm not going to be a dictator about how everybody can define beauty. We can definitely talk about different ideas that could pop up in our, in our minds. Um, and I will start with um, the two predominant definitions of beauty in, in philosophical discourse um, from the history of philosophy. Of course, there's many different conceptions and definitions of beauty um, based on the, like what the, past philosophers have said, um, but I'm going to first outline two of the predominant ones in history, and then we will go on to comment on those and potentially give our own um, interpretations of that and, uh, and of beauty. So the first um, definition I want to outline, and I'm getting, I've read um, specifically for this um, show, I've read a lot of Leo Tolstoy actually, and a lot of people don't necessarily think that Leo Tolstoy is a philosopher. He's more of um, a writer, and, uh, and he definitely is, but he has actually some great philosophical ideas and works as well. So I'm, I'm taking a lot of um, my definitions from Leo Tolstoy. So the first definition that he outlines is that beauty is mystical. And whatever is beautiful has a mystical sense in the sense that humans cannot achieve that beauty. So in this sense, beauty is something existing in itself, a, a manifestation of the absolutely perfect. So in this kind of way, some examples would be uh, like a beautiful idea, uh, a beautiful form from Plato's theory of the forms, right? Something that's unachievable. Um, will is beautiful from, like, from Schopenhauer. That would be one example. Another example would be God. God is beautiful and God is something that we cannot manifest in our human form. And all these examples of I, like I, perfect ideas, perfect forms, perfect spirits, will, God, those are all things that are conceptualized as being unachievable by human standards. And that is what is considered beautiful. And in this sense, what is considered beautiful, it is uh, not based on anything specific. And it's not like, a, it, it's just, God is beautiful, will is beautiful, and that is like the that is the categorization of what is considered beautiful according to this kind of conception of beauty, like of the mystical conception. The other um, main conception of beauty that came after the kind of mystical beauty conception is that beauty is pleasure. Beauty is something that makes you have pleasure, a feeling of subjective feeling of pleasure. So, and in this sense, pleasure does not does not have a sexual um, connotation. There's a they differentiate the 
difference between like kind of like a aesthetic pleasure and a, like a sexual pleasure. So for example, like beauty would be a certain pleasure or experience um, that so, like a, somebody subjectively feels. So if you, let's say you're looking at a painting and you see the painting and you believe that, oh, like the, you, you have a sense of maybe happiness from or um, intrigue from looking at that painting. And in that sense, you could think of that feeling as being pleasure. And that is your subjective pleasure. And that's what makes that thing, that painting beautiful. Um, and another part of this definition that's important is that um, this beauty as, of, as pleasure does not have a specific aim or advantage. You're just kind of looking at something for itself and you feel that pleasure and that's what makes it beautiful. You're not, it, you don't really, it doesn't really apply to like the beauty of friendship or like the beauty of like relationships. It's kind of something that you have completely like kind of tied away from those sorts of restrictions. Um, and in this, and in this sense, the beauty is pleasure conception is very subjective and it's very imprecise. And in this way, like there's kind of, um, there's a very common phrase that people say that beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And in this sense, beauty would be what is considered pleasing to that particular beholder. Um, so that's the, the two specific definitions of beauty that have been talked a lot about in the history of philosophy. One is being a, a kind of a mystical definition of beauty, something that's unattainable by humans. And the other is a subjective pleasure of like beauty is pleasure and that is subjective based on your particular taste or desires and and what if you if you feel pleasure from looking at something or experiencing beauty then that is what's beautiful so those are two definitions um there's definitely other conceptions of beauty in the history of philosophy but those are two main ones and I would like to turn over the floor to anybody who would like to comment on on these um, definitions and what you think about them. Well, I think Leo Toll's story in the end also maybe says that they're in fact the same definition, right? That it, mm -hmm. the pleasure is, you know, what you get from seeing such a like sublime perfectness, and yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think that's sort of his way of like synthesizing them, I guess. Mm hmm. Because uh, spoiler alert to anybody who hasn't read uh, Leo Tolstoy's um, writings about beauty and art is that he eventually concludes that these two definitions of beauty mean nothing for when we're talking about art, um, because the, the main the reason why he is um, bringing up those definitions is because he wants to define what is art. And specifically, he wants to bring up the beauty, beauty because a lot of people define art as what is beautiful. And he uh, objects to that um, definition of art. So that's kind of the reason why he is bringing up those two specific definitions. But in terms of like art, um, to Leo Tolstoy does not believe that beauty is the reason why something is art or or even something that makes art good because those are two dis very different um definitions so but in, if we're just talking about beauty here um yeah definitely like leo tolstoy um would not um he, he i i think um mark is correct in, in terms of like how he just thinks they're both very similar definitions because they both lead to pleasure anyway because if you think of beauty as something that's mystical like oh for example god is what's beautiful right in a way like if you can justify that as being like oh if, if you think god is beautiful you get some sort of pleasure from that or some sort of satisfaction from that so that is like kind of that is yeah so does anybody have anything else to say i can say I something mean, go ahead mikey uh yeah uh I thought it was notable that in your definition or several definitions of beauty as defined by several um, you know ph philosophic traditions you you specifically excluded sexuality or sexual pleasure as being an aspect of beauty and I, I think that's interesting mm -hmm. and 
I wanted to say two things about that. I don't, I'm not going to argue about it, but I wanted to point out two things. One is that mm -hmm. um, is that I wonder if that's because of the medieval natural law theory influence on philosophy, because according to you know medieval natural law, sexuality has a very specific purpose, which is not pleasure, but it's procreation. And so I'm wondering if you, if you could comment on that. And then the second thing I want to say about that is that the, this is in stark contrast to some of the Eastern traditions, specifically uh, Tantric tradition, which originates in Hinduism and Buddhism. And one aspect of the Tantric tradition, tradition is the celebration of the human body and of sexuality as beautiful, um, in my understanding. So anyway, I wanted to point, point those things out and see if anyone has a response to either of those yeah i mean i would just reply to that is i actually uh really appreciate that you brought up that comment and that thought because that is something that i was also thinking about myself when i was going through the reading and i definitely don't agree 100 percent with leo tolstoy and and i guess maybe how he talked about the background of the philosophical um history and tradition regarding beauty um, because he did say that you know s sexual pleasure does not does not count under whatever pleasure that you would get from something that is beautiful. But I can definitely credit Tolstoy, you know, because I, he's not outlining his view. He's just talking about like some other philosophical views. And I definitely think that Michael, your point there about how it might relate to natural law theory, I think that is a really good point. That might be correct. Um, I don't know exactly, if, like based on that, but I think it makes sense that um, that it's either the natural law, you know, theory directly influenced um, conceptions of beauty, or it indirectly did. But either way, I'm sure it had influenced that way. So thank you for bringing that that up. I know, Taken, you wanted to say something earlier. Do I? Sure, why not? <laughs> um, okay, so you know, it's it's great that we touch on um, touch on um, the these thought processes and stuff like that. I think another person, Nicole, that you looked at and that I looked at this evening was none other but the fierce Immanuel Kant. Um, who is actually criticized for for his the lack of meaning he brings to our very discipline. He's in fact he's criticized as saying he's criticized by his critics who say Kant has given us a meaningless world. So with that in mind, let's try and give him the benefit of the doubt here and Briefly, I think it's important to just touch on what what he sees as beauty and what what he perceives to be the mission, particularly as he references um, artwork. And although I would love to say something on um, Michael's comment at some point on uh, the medieval philosophy impact on beauty, but that's another statement which we'll save for later. But um, what I would say about Kant is Kant's primary focus is to take away, to strip away any um, almost emotional walls that, that hinder us from understanding what makes something beautiful. Um, that, that as, as Nicole, you pointed out, beauty is not something that is strictly emotional. But the way we perceive beauty in the 21st century very much is, like, how does this make me feel? How does this speak to me? And, and yeah. what, what am I receiving? Rather, Kant says that we must stay objective when analyzing the thing of artwork or the thing that we are trying to determine what is beautiful. Because th those emotions are so subjective. The, the, you know, are, are, you know, talking about sexuality. Um, the traits we find in people 
attractive are going to differ from each one of us. Um, so he's trying to put forward a method in which we look at the world. Um, in fact, Kant uses the example of the green meadow in a piece of artwork to say that is an objective experience. <laughs> the, the greenness of the meadow is the same for everybody. But yeah. it should be on those merits that something is determined to be beautiful and not necessarily your own personal interpretation. <laughs> now, I think that's whack, <laughs> but because you, you can't separate, really, the human being from their emotions, you may be able to in some senses, but I think... I think we just need to reconsider what we deem art itself, first of all, before we can even talk about beauty and stuff like that. Interesting. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Tegan, for bringing up those thoughts. Um, I guess to say, talk about Kant here. So for, first of all, as a disclaimer, Kant, Immanuel Kant is very difficult to read. <laughs> it's very True. difficult to understand what he's talking about. He... Um, his texts were translated from German, and I believe one of the difficulties of understanding him as somebody as people who speak English and read in English is that there's something about one of the um, parts of a sentence is always at the end of a sentence in German, and then it's hard to translate it over properly. So I had a hard time reading that con article, but I'm happy that Tegan that you tried doing that, and that's that's awesome. So I mean, like I I don't. Like, I, there's a lot of things I didn't understand, like, in the Kant article, and it'll take me, you know, maybe, like, a week or so just combing through it to really understand it 100%. But from what I got from the Kant article um, about beauty um, is that, firstly, Kant always wants to have reason and logic, you know, rule us, and he's a very, very strong proponent of reason and logic and objectivity. That's what uh, Kant is really, really known for, right? And it, he's also known for being somebody who, you know, with his ethics, his ethics are very um, mm -hmm. well known. Like he says, you like you can never lie because lying is always wrong. There's no, there's no reason, there's no, no reasons that lying can ever be okay. Like he's yeah. very like stringent on there's right and wrong things, and yeah, wrong things are always wrong. Like he's very like that kind of that the kind of person. Yeah, yeah. There's no gray area for there's no like gray area Kant. for Kant, right? So his ethics are very well known because of that, um, and for other reasons, he is very um, he's very influential in philosophy. Yeah. He, but it, with that being said, Kant really had a hard time defining beauty, <laughs> and that's mm -hmm. what one thing that made the article really hard to read because I could see him. Like he wasn't not really struggling, but like there's a lot of like considerations that he had to bounce off. And knowing that he has that kind of bias of objectivity and reason and logic, he had a v extremely hard time trying to find an objective definition of beauty. And mm -hmm. from what I got from that article is that he never actually managed to get an objective definition of beauty. Um, and what I what I got from beauty from his of his definition of beauty or his thoughts on beauty is that he concluded that beauty has no discernible purpose it does not align with logic and therefore <laughs> it's, well, beauty is like what well, kind of like whatever right that's kind of what i got from it so like but i think that i think that interpretation is, is somewhat correct that he was say he did say that beauty cannot be the, governed by logic the, the, the determination of beauty is not um, objective or cannot be outlined by logic and there's no purpose to beauty. But I think he really didn't, maybe didn't want to say that because it kind of goes against his philosophical kind of background, right? Because that's, he, his Kant's overall philosophy usually tries to find an objective definition for something. So... I guess, like, even Kant not being able to find an objective definition of beauty, that's really indicative of how difficult it is to really outline um, what beauty is and what beauty isn't. Now, like, if we're talking about our personal um, impressions of what we think beauty is and what it isn't, I would personally say that I, I don't think that there can be an definitive 
like objective definition of beauty. I don't think it's possible to do that. I definitely think it is governed by a sense of subjectivity, maybe like more, you know, say more subjectivity than objectivity. Um, but I, I'm really hesitant to say that like, you know, something that like we can we would all consider beautiful. Like, I don't know, maybe some people wouldn't think trees are beautiful or whatever, but like, there's, I actually know one, I have a friend who's afraid of trees, fun fact, um, but I know, but. And that just I would got say, I would say it's, on Yeah, the, uh, <laughs> yeah, nobody knows who, I don't even remember which friend was afraid of trees, so don't worry, but um, like I was, I was going to use an example of saying that trees are like, I would say trees have some sort of thing that makes them objectively beautiful or nature has something that makes it like objectively beautiful and it's it's really hard to argue against the the you know the my impression that beauty that nature is beautiful it's hard to find an argument against that right um even to some extent like even if you're not like a huge nature person or somebody who really loves hiking or loves outdoors activities i think most people cannot deny that nature has something inherently beauty they're beautiful inside of that now to say what is that quality mm. that makes nature beautiful that's the hard question but if we're talking just strictly uh, about objectivity and subjectivity i can i i would say that like there's it, beauty is neither fully subjective or fully objective i think it's more subjective than objective but it's hard to like really justify saying that there's no objectivity in what is beautiful and what isn't mm. So, Nikki, if I could jump in here real quick <laughs> and just um, read this one quote from Kant to kind of summarize his mission. Uh, uh, the Kant um, portion we are referring to is his critique of aesthetic power of judgment, of the aesthetic power of judgment. And so Kant says the following, Everyone must admit that a judgment about beauty in which there is mi in which in which there is mixed the least interest <laughs> is very oh yeah least interest is very partial not a pure judgment of taste one must not be in in the least least biased in favor of the existence of the thing, so the thing we deem beautiful, but must entirely, entirely be indifferent in this respect in order to play the judge in matters of taste. So, I mean, like, look at that quote. That is, that's a tough quote to do because, but I think it's interesting that he makes that distinction between <laughs> taste right because mm -hmm. what is taste that 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 isn't even an objective thing <laughs> so... i think he, he he tries to define taste objectively um because that's what he does and that's what a lot of philosophers do i mean he does yeah. but he can't <laughs> anyway i think yeah no it, it's I difficult did, yeah. right like i he's i can't try really hard to have a to create an objective definition of beauty but um <laughs> I think he I think he's largely right about the fact that there can be some sort of objective um evaluation of taste maybe like um I, I maybe not I I I'm kind of feel I'm kind of on the fence about it a little bit but could you say that somebody has bad taste Yeah I th I think you could when it when it pertains to um, social expectations and social like, norms, and and I'm saying not to like offend anybody who has this stuff on their car, but like, what if like I bought like a a nice car and I put a bunch of flame de fire decals all over it and like wrote in big sharpie all over my car and I said it's beautiful, right? Like, I have no offense to anybody who did who who has done that. But let's say it's like super messy and it's like not coordinated and whatever. And I say it's beautiful. Could you say that I have bad taste? Yeah, I could because I'm your <laughs> friend. But <laughs> <laughs> but like why? It, it, like friends, like friends, sure, because you want to be kind of want to be honest, right? But even behind that, 
what allows you to make that distinction that somebody has a good taste or bad taste? Because I am outside of your own head. I am able to critically assess, okay, for you, that might be the nicest car you've ever seen. But for the vast majority of people that, that don't know you, that, that can't you know relate to you and kind of your thought processes, a majority of people would be like, wait, what, 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 like, what, what is this, you know, but I mean, it's a fair question, right, like, and this is, you know, we ask this question a lot in philosophy, what right do you have, but uh, the, the simple fact is, right, I am, or Mark is, or Michael is, outside of your own personal world, right, so we can look at it a little more objectively and say, well, yeah, N N Nicole's her friend, but the majority of people are going to look at this and kind of shake their head a little bit. But I love, I love that you brought up, Sorry. I just want to, I just want to say a quick thing. You brought up, ob you used the word objectivity and objective. You used it in a different <laughs> way that we're using it now. Did, did you notice that? Objective, when you used that objective in that last sentence that you said, when you could say, I am outside of your head, therefore I can look at something objectively. In that way, you're using objective as like kind of like a third, you know, like kind of in a movie, there's like an objective view would be like kind of like a third person, a third person view or whatever, right? Yeah, in that way, you're I, kind of, you're I kind have, of using objective yeah. that way. So that's, I have, <laughs> that's just I have one thing. I have no bias to, <laughs> to suggest. Just as the general spectator would have no bias because you're not their friend. They can't relate to you. They haven't dwelt in your world. So they're just going to be like, what the heck, man? <laughs> yeah. No, Mark, go ahead. They, they, they would have, I, I guess it depends what you mean by bias. At least I would classify it. But, you know, they've perhaps been grown up with and, you know, and, yeah, grown up with certain aesthetic, you know, uh, yeah, an aesthetic culture that they sort of, you know, taken on. And I feel like it sort of causes an issue when you sort of appeal to society, right? Because you can definitely give an objective answer about, you know, what aesthetic things a, a certain society would consider to be, uh, you know, a good ideal. Um, but it, it sort of seems to, to me at least, that aesthetics uh, goes beyond sort of, you know, just what a, societal expectation of it should be and it, it sort of creates another problem in which it, it's sort of like the same thing with cultural relativism in that you know well you know if society's expectations change well then what is objectively good right or objectively aesthetic they also change so in that way it becomes subjective as well again hey i have a question for you guys um is a symphony, what we might call a beautiful symphony, beautiful piece of music, is is it intrinsically beautiful? Like if there were no perceivers, if there was was nobody listening to it, would it still be beautiful? And and if so, then it seems like we should be able to develop a technolo technology like instruments, scientific instruments that would be able to detect beauty. The <laughs> The problem becomes the fact that that piece of music was still composed by a human person. With with although there is an interesting uh, exception, um, <laughs> Beethoven. Um, you know, but but like no, I'm serious though because you think of it as, as he lost his hearing but continued to compose. That being able to perceive it auditorily became more and more difficult but there would still have been the vibrations from the instruments so the 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 idea of beauty i think beauty really has been understood as a metaphysical you know spiritual emotional experience so i think it would be hard to put into put into a shall i say a material representation uh, of what beauty looks like i think i don't know how would you guys answer that question 
What, what, what was the question exactly again? What was your question, Mikey? I kind of ruined it. Sorry about that. Here, I'll, I'll, I'll answer your quest, question by reading a, a couple sentences, sentences from David Hume, one of my favorites. Beauty is no quality in things themselves. It exists merely in the mind which contemplates them. At each mind perceives a different beauty. One person may even perceive deformity where another is sensible of beauty. And every individual ought to acquiesce in his own sentiment without pretending to regulate those of others. That's David Hume. Yeah. I have, I have something to, to bring up. So uh, this is uh, this is like a I guess a consideration is often brought up in any like academic discourse about any topic. But to what extent like is our perceptions of beauty influenced by our society versus like ourselves? And like what if we like took ourselves out of this society or is never like born like into this society? Like would like how to, to what extent would that define like our conceptions of beauty? Because like my thought is like are there any things that are considered beautiful like that are common to like all societies and like and vastly different types of societies even isolated societies like are there things that are considered beautiful you know regardless like uh, of i guess like so social uh, uh, upbringing and i would say like maybe like i i don't know exactly i don't know that like statistically or you know or empirically but i I would guess that like something like nature would be considered beautiful to some extent all across all cultures. Maybe that's what, that would be my closest guess. And maybe then the, maybe the human form, female form would be another one. Yeah. I mean, it, it's an interesting question, like talking about like sort of this nature versus nurture sort of debate, right? And, you know, how much each of them play into our roles. But I feel like the thing is that, you know, that humans are like inherently like social animals, right? You, you, you just can't grow, grow up with any connection to anyone. So it, it sort of seems a bit like unanswerable or just in itself, you know, talking about, okay, well, you know, about a human without any social connections or interaction really. Although, although I would, I would still say it's possible. I'm gonna take up probably the <laughs> the least offendable position there is in this thing, for the sake of playing the devil's advocate here, and say, uh, but I, th but I think there is innately an ability for human beings to perceive beauty and to respond to beauty by virtue of human emotions. Um, regardless of how much, you know, you could argue that lack of social interaction affects the development of those emotions, but even the rawest form of emotion is going to respond to stimulus. So, so I would argue on that basis <laughs> of, of emotional and even physiological um, which I guess I an objection. <laughs> objection to that objection. Sorry, I just wanted to bring this. It's a silly point, but like, for those people who don't have emotions, mm -hmm. like the you know antisocial personality disorder, like the very mm -hmm. extreme cases for that, um, mm -hmm. are are they like outliers, and we just kind of take them out of the equation, well, or can, can we, like, mean, or I'm... or do we like? Or philosophical zombies, that? for the matter. I mean, I mean, but are they? Because because even though they can't relate to anybody else, mm -hmm. they can still relate to themselves. That's they, true. They, they, right. they can they can think that something within themselves is beautiful or right something uh, or emotional. although although they won't be able to label that. But but mm -hmm. even like even you look at um, you look at their ability to. Um, mirror a person's personality um mm -hmm. if if they're more a sociopath where where they can mirror a person's you know they can pick up on that so if if the personality in which they're mirroring um perceive something as beautiful they they're able to at least portray that if they don't actually physically emotionally experience that they they still know 
that something is happening. I actually watched an interview with someone who struggles with this, and he talked about um, how one of his relatives had passed away, and and they discussed how the tears that he saw his family crying, he couldn't understand, but he knew there was something. He knew there was something abnormal going on. So even if you don't physically experience it, I would still say they have the ability to perceive it. And even in that perception is part of the experience of beauty. I'm going awesome. um, I'm gonna argue for a third position. So um, just to recap, so one position would be that beauty is subjective, that it only exists in the experience of the perceiver and there's nothing in intrinsically beautiful or not beautiful about matter. The other, the opposite position is that there is a objective intrinsic beauty in things separate from the way they're perceived or whether they're perceived. But there's a third position which I want to point out which is that is that matter and the arrangement of matter is not intrinsically beautiful, but humans are wired in such a way that that humans are wired to perceive certain things as beautiful. So the reason that a vast majority of human beings, I'm going to suggest, would find a sunset, you know, an orange sunset, um, beautiful, is not because the orange sunset is objectively intrinsically beautiful, but it's because human beings are wired. Mm -hmm. such um, in such a way as to perceive the sunset as beautiful mm -hmm. so that's that's a third um, a third position and before we go forward with that I do want to first I, I brought I brushed upon this point briefly but this also this is I think this is important there's different definitions of objectivity and what is considered objective so <laughs> so michael brought up actually a really good thing that we should we that I, I think actually his third point works but it, it actually um it's a little bit contingent on what we're considering objective and not objective so i guess one definition of objectivity which is the third point that michael brought up is that something like whatever is objective is something that is independent of humans entirely right like it's like uh Something that's objective is something that kind of is objective before human perception. There's like that's like it exists like the rocks exist in the world, like an, an objective, like an objective fact, right? Um, like the rocks Beauty. will be there if we are there, if we are there or not. I I don't want to like I'm just giving kind of a it might be not a great example, but that and we can talk we can argue about different the different definitions of objectivity because not everybody agrees on which definition should be used when, when philosophers are talking about objectivity. So that kind of muddies up the conversations a little bit because we don't always see, all use the same terminology or interpret the same terminology the same way. So one definition of objectivity is that it, it, will, it exists and will exist regardless of humans being on Earth. That's like one, and that's kind of like how a, a tree, right? You could say a tree is objectively beautiful without humans being there. You could, you could say that, right? Mm. Another definition of objectivity is that something is considered objectively beautiful ba based on societal perceptions. So let's say that for this, and this relates to Michael's third point, because you could say that um, a tree is not beautiful like without like human, before humans perceive it and apply like a societal or popular kind of uh, interpretation towards what is considered beautiful in their society, right? So you could say object, something can be considered objective um, within human perception and within societies. So like, let's say, for example, um, objective morality, right? Um, one, de one example of objective morality could be like, oh, like killing is bad, oh, killing is always bad regardless of if humans are on Earth or not on Earth, whatever, right? That's one definition of objective morality. Another definition of objective morality is like killing is bad, but depends on which society that you live in today, right? Because some societies might think that killing isn't that bad, right? So like morality is objective to the extent to which society you live in, right? And that's kind of human perception. That's one definition of objectivity. 
Another definition of objectivity, which Tegan actually brought up here, is that <laughs> something can be considered objective when it's outside of your own perception. So like a third person view. That would be another definition of objectivity. So I know this, I just, all this talk is just to say that there's a lot of contentions about what is considered objective and not all philosophers are thinking about the same thing when they talk about objectivity. And, but this, but my, Michael's point still stands here because, you know, like there's, I guess that you could say the, you say one pull one um, definition of beauty is the subjective definition, right? Subjective. The other one is the objective definition right? And that objective definition is like w without humans, without human perception or before human perception. And Michael's third point, forgive me if I kind of butchered a little bit, but like uh, uh, something is considered beauty, beautiful after like the like human perception and like interpretation. So it's not like before that, it's like after um, humans kind of interpret it and apply their own understandings to it. So hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, I'm going to uh, give another example, that, which might even um, more clearly, or at least as clearly as what you said, um, illustrate the difference in the way that we use the word objective. So imagine um, like the traffic laws. So the rules around driving, right? It's the maximum speed limit and you have to stop at a red light and all that stuff. So now... Um, somebody vi violates the law and they wind up in court and the judge says look we have objective rules here it's not the the cop the police officer doesn't just decide on his or her own whether or not you did something wrong we have a book of rules that says what you're supposed to do these are objective rules well objective in the, is used there to mean that um it's not up to each individual but there are uh, people have gotten together and they've and they've written down rules that apply to everybody, and and they're and, and hopefully they're clear and, um, and and that kind of thing, but that's not a philosopher's definition of objective. So the philosopher's definition of object, objective would 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 um, would hold that those rules that are written are subjective. They're not objective because they're written by people. They only exist in people's minds. Mm -hmm. They're what um, John Searle, one of my favorites, he, he calls that institutional reality. It's ontologically subjective. The origin, the existence of rules about stopping at red lights and how fast you can go are all made up by people in their minds. They're institutional because they're um, collectively made up by groups of people, but they're still only in people's minds. If there were no people, there would be no speed limit. <laughs> right? So so under that philosopher's view of objectivity, laws and rules are all subjective. The rock itself is um, possibly objective, but even that could be a uh, challenge in this way. Um, I could say, and, and um, I'm, I'm not the one that thought of this, I, I could take the anti-Aristotelian view that um, even the idea of a tree even the idea of a rock, those things are subjective. Because the only thing that's objective is matter. There's matter. <laughs> and and people in their minds, because of their peculiar way that they experience matter, the way they sense matter because of the particular sense organs they have, they construct this this uh, you know, this um experience of a rock or of a tree and uh, it, I'm being anti-Aristotelian in saying, in suggesting that there is no rock, there is no tree. There's just a bunch of matter arranged in a certain way. And that's all that there is until mm -hmm. there's a perceiver to turn it into a rock and turn it into a tree. No. Yeah. Um, no. <laughs> no. No. I, mean, I would say first, there's some Go philosophers on. that like that kind of like I think like Michael's definition of like or, or distinction between the kind of philosophers' interpretation of objectivity and subjectivity is kind of like I think it's the traditional way of doing it. But there's a lot of philosophers and ph works of philosophy out there that kind of mess up the definitions or distinctions between subjectivity and objectivity. Like for example, saying that. Oh, um, these these morals are objective, right? And they say, oh, these morals are are object. This is objective morality. Uh, people must, you know, um, value the val 
I don't know, beneficence in healthcare, right? But then it's only objective within healthcare institutions. The healthcare institutions are the ones that make these rules and there's their objective when you're working within those institutions but not like it's not they're subjective on a personal level or when you when you take away those institutions like is beneficence really um objective no it's something that's created within a human minds right which is which aligns with what michael is saying so one thing uh, one thing i, I do want to say is like that there are some philosophers and philosophy out there that does still mix up that definition and the distinctions between objectivity and subjectivity is still and it's still really um they don't they, people are not using the same definitions so that's just one thing i wanted to say yeah no i i think the personally i think the word mind dependent is a bad word for when talking about something unreal or something real because i don't really think it sort of captures what is normally meant by it as in like uh, normally I think the word belief uh, independent would be something a lot better than, you know, for, for uh, words such as real in a metaphysical sense, because people everywhere, you know, we sort of talk about us having objective conscious experiences, right? Or it's not the case that it's a subjective matter. If my friend Bob has a conscious experience or not. Yeah. And this is where the word belief independent becomes a bit more useful in that it him having a conscious experience is more is not dependent on a belief of him having a conscious experience. He just does. Uh, whereas if you use the word mind dependent, well, then of course he doesn't. Then of course it's you know mind dependent on whether or not he has a conscious experience. And in fact, uh, John Searle said something. Uh, bit similar in uh, the social construction of reality um he uses different words but he, he he definitely does believe that you know uh like there is an objective winner of a chess game you know even though the rules are subjectively made you can still give a sub objective answer to the question you know depending on these different social facts and so on and you know he he does it through various methods like collective intentionality and so on so so mark i i have a question for you then if if belief dependent is a better term although i would argue so i would suggest instead of belief dependent i would say it's experientially dependent independent because it's independent from your own personal experience like you're not experiencing his <laughs> conscious experience so hmm. so you don't have to experience me breathing <laughs> to assume that i'm breathing it's, but, it's a pretty well, our, like I, our experience is kind of influenced by our beliefs as well i mean yeah but but i i don't know guys this is confusing. <laughs> yeah belief is an experience i think but yeah, because I would say belief is, yeah, but I would say, yeah, this is where it gets tricky because I'm tempted yeah. to say it's an assumption, but that's the very point we're trying to get away from is that, that it's my, it's my subjective assumption. So I don't know. I, I think we're getting know. at the same thing more or less. I think maybe we're just using words differently perhaps yeah but. yeah because because i'm saying to because i guess my question for mikey about the rocks is just because something is not spoken or not experienced does that make it not a reality mm -hmm. human beings have evolved with certain sense organs. Other animals. I'm not asking about that. Well, no, I'm. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm no, asking. I'm getting to your. I'm getting to your. I'm making my argument to address your point. Go ahead. Other animals have either sense organs that are absent in people, or that work differently, that are more sensitive or less sensitive than people's. How can it be that the particular way that humans experience things in the world 
because of the sense organs we have, how can that be, isn't it arrogant and ethnos or um, anthropocentric to claim that we somehow see the world as it is, whereas every other kind of animal is mistaken in some way or is deficient or seeing it in a distorted way? Uh, that's, I mean, um, that's a good point. Like, monkeys yeah. aren't, like, doing physics as well, right? Or, like, it, that, <laughs> how, and again, putting their own and arguing against our theories, right? So, I mean, it's possible, but, right? It's possible that uh, animals will s see the world differently or are able to come to different conclusions about the nature of matter and the nature of chemistry. Potentially, maybe we're just, our, the way our brains are wired will just ultimately lead us to the wrong conclusions every time. I mean, Maybe even humans, you know, don't have the same world view. We disagree vastly yeah. with each other. So yeah, I guess yeah, one but, thing I want to say is like uh, we have we don't have a lot of time left, so I just kind of want to tie it back to beauty and how does all of this conversation um, kind of influence um, you know our our discourse on beauty and the question that we came into um, this show today was what is beauty. Do we have a better understanding or I guess like maybe we should go do a kind of round table thing of what what does each person here really think is the their I guess your perception of beauty or and what did you did you learn did you change your perspective based on this conversation at all? Take and you wanna go first? Oh wow, okay. Um, so so much to process, but I guess yeah. if you ask me ask me now what beauty is. Beauty is can be understood as an experience, can be understood as an emotional experience, but can also be viewed as some objective things that we deem to be beautiful, such as traits within human beings. Um, landscapes, um, experiences, which, which, all those things are beautiful. So I guess I would define beautiful in this way. Something that points or resonates with an individual in a very unique way, but that is also a common experience. Okay, thank you, Tegan. Uh, Michael, what's your, what do you think? I'm going to take a combination view. Um, I think, uh, as I indicated earlier, that there's nothing intrinsically beautiful or not beautiful about matter in in, in itself. Um, I but I but I do think that human beings are have evolved and are wired in a certain way, where um, there's a tendency, an, an innate tendency, um, for there to be certain things that are perceived as beautiful by by human beings having said that there's a third um complication which is that it's also culturally influenced so uh so what is perceived as beautiful might vary somewhat from culture to culture or subculture to subculture at the same time as there is a tendency for certain things to be perceived widely or commonly as beautiful but going back to my beginning of my theory, it's all subjective in the sense that it only exists in human minds. Mm -hmm. And one thing I do want to bounce off that with before we get to Mark is that, can you say again that somebody has bad taste in beauty? That's the one, I think that's something that we're a little bit stuck on still, and we have a little bit of time to dive into that before we end. Well, um, I think maybe I can give my opinion on that. Um, I, I, I sort of feel like what I say is different from what how I actually feel about it, the situation. Because um, to me, when I, you know, let's take music genres or different musics, right? Uh, songs, yeah. Uh, in that, you know, I, if I can, you know, sometimes if I like show some music to some other people, you know, I sort of have this feeling that, oh, well, you know, they normally listen to this type of genre of music and they're trying to like sort of shove that music into the certain mode of listening to it. And they're sort of misunderstanding music in that way. And I feel like, mm. you know, you can, 
you can uh, you can criticize music you know if you understand the like mode that it's supposed to be listened in and i feel like you can give a you know a general critique of it and you know if if you say well you have bad taste right in music right you'd have to criticize that specific mode of listening so you know naturally maybe it's not for you that there is like you know some sort of more hyper music or you know a certain different type of it but but is there like a difference between like when we talk about taste between you saying thinking that somebody has bad taste because you don't you personally don't like that or that you can there's some sort of objective way to say that somebody has bad taste and what they consider beautiful I, can you can, can we like all say can we like uh, let's can we as a collective can we agree on something that would is ugly <sighs> let's let's try it let's try let's start with that like can can we can we all agree on that and does that make it objective and that can that could, be objectively said as like bad taste you could argue that you know since we're like all human right we have something in common you know uh the you know life is you know we all have certain similar problems and we all go through many of the same things actually so i think there is sort of a way in which you can talk about like societal things that you know everyone sort of has experienced and you can talk about different arts as being dependent on those sort of things and fulfilling those ideals like uh romantic movies are very popular i guess and i guess you know love is a very common issue to most people mm-hmm. <laughs> or yeah, uh, and- central focus <laughs> i guess mark like what is if you were to say it concisely like what would be your personal definition of beauty um personal definition of beauty yeah, I and or like what you got from this show and if it changed like your your the, perspective when you came into this show this is I, well i can maybe answer that question with i guess without answering a, a, in some sort of way and there's actually a oh well, i'll just paraphrase him now but kierkegaard sort of you know he said like uh you know anyone who's in love doesn't need a definition of love you know <laughs> to know that they're in love so that's sort of what I'll go with with beauty. <laughs> I think that's an acceptable answer. Um, yeah, but we have one minute left, I guess. Does anybody have any last words, last thoughts? Beauty is confusing, and I don't think I'm ever going to look at it quite the same way ever again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this show can have that effect sometimes. I just wanted to say this has been a very beautiful show. Right. Well, you come we up can with objectively that? agree on that. <laughs> no, yeah. no, we can't. I disagree. <laughs> well, then you said that. Devil's advocate is coming back. <laughs> you always disagree. <laughs> That's your job. But... Someone has to. Yeah, exactly. But thank you, everybody, um, for listening. This is the Canadian Philosophy Show. Uh, my name is Nicole Kerrigan. I'm here with my lovely um, co-hosts, Mark, Michael, and Tegan. Thank you so much for being here. And thank you all for all the listeners for listening to this. I hope you found this useful and insightful. <laughs>